Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity we have together here on your holy day and to again study the things of your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue this study in the three angels' messages, that your, your spirit would be with us. Give us wisdom and guidance, dear Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. As I said, this is part three of the study of the three angels' messages. We're moving this segment from the other meeting room that we were in into this one. And we'll pick it up right where we left off the last time with a review of some of the things that we had been studying together. And when we look at the three angels' messages, we find several things that are quite significant that we should make note of. The first of these 10 points is the third angel's message is a preaching of what? Everlasting the everlasting gospel. See how helpful I am? <laughs> it's the presentation of the everlasting gospel. So take your Bibles. I want us to read these messages as we start now so that you can see exactly what they are. Revelation, the 14th chapter. And beginning with verse 6. Revelation 14 and verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. So it is a worldwide proclamation saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the, what? Hour of, Hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's the first angel. The second angel and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then the third angel's message is about the mark of the beast. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth his mark, or the mark of his name. So these are the three angels' messages. In addition to the everlasting gospel, the second point is that this gospel is to be proclaimed around the world. It is a worldwide proclamation. And in this proclamation, it is a call to come back to a true worship in opposition to the Babylonian or confused religious state that exists. In order to have a true worship, you must acknowledge God as the creator. This is a real problem because we, we did a study on this a while back uh, about how much of Christianity has rejected the literal six-day creation. And even some of our own institutions are doing this today. You cannot truly worship God when you reject that God is a creator of all things. And the, four, uh, the fifth one is there's a proclamation that the judgment has begun. The judgment has begun. And that judgment began when? 1844. So the, the hour of his judgment is come. Okay? Then as we move into the second angel's message, it is simple. Babylon has fallen. Babylon means what? Confusion. And all of the confused religious bodies in the world have fallen from what? From what? 
well, yeah. But what caused them to fall from, okay, that's what caused them to fall from grace. They reject truth, they have fallen, and all nations have been corrupted by Babylon. As a matter of fact, Babylon and one component of that is the beast, and it says that all the world wondered after the beast. Yes. Exactly. You cannot reject God. You cannot reject God's word because in doing that, you automatically are worshiping Satan because you have rebelled, and that's what uh, Satan's all about, the great rebel. Yes. Now, as we come to the third angel's message, the message there is not to worship the beast. Who is the beast? Pardon me? I'm getting some different answers. It's a papacy. It's the Roman church. Yes. You say that, you say that the Babylon is the same thing with the uh, Egyptian? I mean, Egypt? No, totally different. different. Yeah, totally different. Babylon, the beginning of Babylon was with Nimrod after the flood. God had told them to go out all over the earth. Nimrod pulled them all together in what is now Iraq and he built this tower where God destroyed the tower of Babel and the people were dispersed. It, it is always a sign of rebellion against God and confusion for it was there that God confused the languages. Well, no, they're, they're still total, two different entities. Yeah, Egypt is not a spiritual place. It's, not, it's always been in rebellion against God. But Babylon encompasses all of these. And so Egypt is referring to a specific place and a specific attitude in, in uh, Revelation 11. Okay, now we look at the eighth, the ninth point is not only are we not to worship the beast, we're not to worship his what? Image. His image. Okay, what is an image? Likeness. It's a likeness to something else. And so there is a beast, there is an image, and there is a mark, and we're not to receive the mark. Now, it's not the mark of the image. It's the mark of what? Beast. It's the mark of the beast. But the image has received that or does receive that. Now, what is the mark of the beast? Sunday worship. Sunday worship. Legislated Sunday worship is what that's really all about. And so, in this message, there in Revelation, we find that it is to go into all the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is followed by a fourth angel. So let's go back to Revelation now and go to the 18th chapter and watch what happens when the fourth angel joins the other three. I find it very interesting that even among our own people, you know, our church here has a ministry called the fourth angel's ministry. And I have people, when I go out to different places, say, well, what's the fourth angel? What's that mean? Friends, if, if we do not know who the fourth angel is and what that message is, how can we proclaim the first three? Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 18 and beginning with verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was what? So, as with the first angel that goes to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, this one is going to lighten the whole earth, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now, where do we see that message? 
in the second, the second angel's message. So this picks up with those other messages, but it's going to deal with a little more, or actually a whole lot more detail. Because besides saying Babylon has fallen, has fallen, as in the second message, it says it has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Why? For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, going right back to the second. Keep your finger here. Jump back a minute to chapter 14 at this second angel. I want you to see the similarity in, in the wording even. Revelation 14 and verse 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Same words. Now watch. Why has she fallen? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of what? Her fornication. Now back to 18. And look, and look at this in verse 18 again. It says, for all, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the reason for her fall, and this is the reason for actually the fall of the world. Because all of the world has followed after the beast. They have rejected the truth of God's word. And as a result, Babylon now is being controlled by demons. There is the absence of the Holy Spirit. Now watch. Um, committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven say... Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So what does this tell us? This, this verse right here, what does it say? Okay, so he has people in Babylon. He couldn't be saying, come out of her, my people, if he did not have people there. This is important to understand because too often we get a superficial view of this and we think that everybody that's in Babylon is bad and rejected God. No, God has faithful people there that just don't know about this yet. Here's what he warns them. Be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So this is that fourth angel's message that joins with the first three and gives a whole worldwide proclamation now, part of the everlasting gospel, part of the judgment hour message, that, uh, that they have apostatized to the point that the, uh, the truth of God's word is being suppressed. So this angel here, he now does something. This fourth angel's message is that Babylon is what? Babylon is fallen. Second part of it, it's become the habitation of what? Habitation of devils. We find what kind of spirit there? Foul spirit, not the Holy Spirit. It's a habitation of devils and the key of it's, a, it's foul spirit rather than the Holy Spirit. We find that it's an unclean and hateful bird rather than the heavenly dove. You see the contrast from what it should be to what it has become. It says that all nations have committed fornication with her. And then the sixth point, God calls his people to come out of her. Now, why does he call them to come out of her? Because he doesn't want them to be lost. He says, come out of her that you do not partake of her sins and receive of her plague. He does not want them to take part in her sins or her plagues. 
So the, this fourth angel's message is to uh, enlighten the whole earth. The entire earth is to see the light of this fourth angel's message. It is a worldwide proclamation. That's why on the, our logo, it said, anybody know what our logo does say besides fourth angel ministries? And do all the world. It is a worldwide ministry that we have going on. It's not one just in Fort Worth, Texas. It's one that reaches out from where we are around the whole world. By the grace of God, oh, we've already reached four different continents with our material. It's in many different languages. And it's going to keep growing by God's grace because it's to go and lighten the whole world. But before God causes people out of Babylon, he pronounces her fall and declares that she has become the habitation of demons. Because Babylon rejected God's word, she has become controlled by demons. This will happen to any entity, whether it is an organization or an individual. You reject God, his word, his spirit, Guess who now has control? Satan. You will be controlled by demonic powers. It, that's the simplicity of it. And even with the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the world today, most of God's people are still to be found in Babylon. And that's what our ministry is. To be calling them out of Babylon and into his marvelous light. However, the time has come for those that are in Babylon, those who truly love God and submitted their lives to him to sever all connection with those who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Those who have a form of godliness but are denying the very power thereof. So he calls them out. He says, come out of her, my people. Now, my question is, and you've heard me ask this before, how far out is out? All the way out. Sever all connections with her so that you do not partake of her sins, so that you do not receive her plagues. In other words, if you don't come all the way out, then you don't sever all connections. Then you are partakers of her sins. But maybe not all of them. But how many sins does it take to be lost? You see. So there must be a complete severance. The humble, sincere, devoted children of God will heed his call and will separate themselves from Babylon's communion and place themselves under the protection of their heavenly father. Thus these escape the outpouring of the seven last plagues um, when this great horror comes in remembrance before God. So God's last call to his people is to what? Come out of Babylon. Now, I want to touch on something here a little, little different. Can you tell me exactly who it is that is not a part of Babylon? Who is not a part of Babylon? Well, he's the head of it. <laughs> yeah, who is not a part of Babylon? The remnant. That's the only people in the world that are not a part of Babylon. They are not an offspring of Babylon. But yet we have people today that say that the remnant has become Babylon. Now, what counsel do we have on that in inspiration? If any arise among us or apart from us with a message that the remnant is to be numbered with Babylon, you may know what? That God has not sent them. Anytime anybody brings that kind of a message, you may know that God is not with that person or that group of people 
but rather they have run ahead of God and are now bringing a message of satanic origin. Something to be careful of. There is one very important question that demands a thoughtful, intelligent, biblical answer, and that is when God's people are called out of Babylon, where are they to come to? To the remnant. They're not called just to wander aimlessly in little home churches or little groups here and there. There will be a time when everybody will have to go into hiding that way, but they are not called out to go their own way and do their own thing in their own little localities. They are called out to become a part of the remnant church. And as we look about us today, we discover there are a multitude of professed Christian churches today. Just in the United States alone, do you know how many supposed Christian denominations there are? Somebody's remembering good. 1187. There's a book that was written listing all of these 187 and or 1187 and every one of them are crying out come join us we have the truth we're right we're the only true one have you ever seen a church anywhere that puts a sign on their door that says come join us because we reject the truth Put an ad in the newspaper. Come join our church because we don't practice what the word of God says. You know, they might as well because many of them do that anyway. They just don't advertise it. Yes. Yeah, yeah the, the churches are not what God would have them to be. And of all of these different churches around the world, God recognizes how many? Two. Two. One, he says, is his remnant. He says that she is the pure woman standing on the moon and clothed with the sun. And the other one is in chapter 18, 17 and 18 the great whore, the harlot, and the mother of harlots. Two groups and only true. So if you're not a part of the remnant, you're a part of what? The other. It's that simple. And on her head is a name written. What's it say? <coughs> Let's take a look at something. Okay, I got too many blank looks. We got to go back here. Okay. Chapter 17. And there came one of the, of the angels which had the seven vials. This is the seven plagues. Okay. And talked with me, saying, Come unto, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many what? What does water represent in scripture? People, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so it says here, this great whore is sitting or above ruling over all of these various nations with whom the kings of the earth have committed what? Fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see, it's the same language that we find in the second angel's message, the same language that we find in the fourth angel's message. And then he describes this woman down in verse 5. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. 
Now, this great harlot is a what? Okay, but she's a woman. What does a woman represent? A church. So she is a impure, corrupt, fornicating, spiritually fornicating church. And she has what? The mother of? So she's got kids. Other churches. If the mother's a church, her offspring are churches. You know, a, a St. Bernard does not have a Shetland pony. Okay? A Chihuahua does not have a thoroughbred. Whatever the mother is, is what the offspring will be. And so we see that this is what's taking place today. One of these churches, he calls this chaste virgin, his bride, his remnant, and all the others who are not a part of that remnant, he calls Babylon, the great whore and all of her harlot daughters. Of these two churches, one is seeking to turn people to God and to the truths of his word. And the other is guilty of turning them away from God's word to doctrines of devils and cunningly devised fables. One of these churches, the devil seeks to destroy. The other, he supports her and directs her apostasy. One is the bride of Christ. The other is the mistress of Satan. And everybody's in one of these two. Is there any, is there any part of, of Europe that doesn't go by the Catholics? Oh, yeah. Can you name one? Albania, for one. What, what are they? Are they uh, monks? Or? Atheists. Atheists. <laughs> Most all of them are atheists. Uh, and you see, when we say Catholic, remember, the term Catholic is not a bad term, but we, we limit the meaning of the word because Catholic just means universal. Okay, it's not a bad word. But we have Roman Catholic, Greek Catholic. We, instead of calling them Catholic, they call them Orthodox. Russian Orthodox, Armenian we have different factions of Catholicism in itself. Some people think that when you say Catholic, you're talking only about Roman Catholic, but it isn't. Usually the Catholic church part of it is with the capital C. This saying Catholic is usually with the lower C. That's because it's a name, but you see, we have come to say that when we ever we see that word Catholic, that all by itself, that it is Roman Catholic, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It's the same way with Protestant. What does Protestant mean? That protests these errors, these apostasies. But Protestantism, I don't think is dying. I think it's pretty well dead. They just haven't completely buried it yet. Because aside from us, nobody else even wants to be referred to as a Protestant. Because that separates. Because they no longer protest the apostasy. And as long as, as, long as the Lord gives his church life, we will protest anything that is contrary to his word or his will. That's what we've been called to do, yes. For example, that's another one. They, they say we don't belong to anybody in the denomination. Yeah. So this lady came over to Walmart telling me about Jesus and all that. And she was, she was focusing more on uh, witchcraft. And I asked her, well, what, which church do you belong? Not uh, your own body. Because if you don't belong to the body of Christ, you're nobody. Yeah, and people you try. Don't belong to either one. People try to get around this and say, oh, well, we're independent. We're non-denominational. Well, denominational is not a bad thing. What is, 
What does it mean to be denominated? Pardon me? Named? Grouped? Counted? We talk about money in certain denominations, a certain grouping or counting, numbering of it. To it all that means is that it is a group of people with like beliefs. And that is only bad when those beliefs are not based upon scripture. That's the only time it's bad. Yes. Can I ask a question? Gene brought up, you know, witchcraft and stuff. Do you think people are still possessed by demons? Oh, I know they are. And they have to be. <laughs> yes, I know they are. I've had to deal with that in the past. Oh, have you? oh yes, ma'am. I surely have. So, yes, it does happen. Um, so, Brett? Yes, when they start um, going towards the enforcing of the Sunday, do you think it'll be like it is now, where they'll just go to church and then do whatever they want, or do you think it'll be more like they try to enforce the whole day like Saturday should be observed? Um, well, no, the, when they f pass the, the national and universal Sunday laws, it will be a very strict law. Yeah. Similar to Constantine's, you're forbidden to work, you're forbidden to do anything except go to Can't church. Buy Can't buy and sell. So it'll be very strictly oh, okay. enforced, yes. Who used that offensively? The people not doing Sunday? Yeah. If you get it, then it's communicated. And it's that way in some states in this country. I've been in places where uh, it's, it's totally illegal. When I lived in Europe, I shared with you folk before, I think, that I was threatened to be arrested because I hung my feather bed out the window on a Sunday. You can't do that on Sunday. You don't want to see the feather. Yeah. Okay, there's only one way, we're going to have to quickly go through this now, that we can tell the truth from the false, and that is by the Word of God. This Word is warned that even at the time of the disciples, that there would come a falling away and many would depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But even within the church, men would arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. All of these are warnings from the early church. When Jesus established his church, it was with the desire that they may all be one. If you read that prayer in John 17, and that there should be no schism in the body, but look at the schisms today. Even within particular names of churches, how many different Baptist, church. Baptist churches are there? You see, all these different Free will Baptist, Southern Baptist, other Baptists, that, Primitive Baptist. huh? Primitive Baptist. Yeah, they've got all these different names. Now, the Southern Baptist has changed its name. The old diehard Southern Baptists aren't going to buy that. There's a there's a so controversy we, we in that right. Just a second. There's a controversy in there right now. Why do they want to get rid of the name Southern Baptist Church? Slaves, exactly. It had to do with slave owning, and most of the clan were Southern Baptists. So they want to change the name to move away from that. That's the motive behind it. It's still the same group of people. Okay, Tino. What I'm saying is that with all these Baptist names, Southern, whatever they are, are they not associated with each other? No. They're different. Companies. They're completely different. They're similar, but they are different. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's true also. Uh, that, 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 uh, that's something that a lot of people are not aware of. Okay, so as believers in the early church began to depart from the plain teachings of Scripture... 
and the unity of the faith begin to dissolve. And if you look at church history, what happened uh, in those early centuries and particularly by the, well, even at the time of John and in the first century there, there were already crazy things going on in the church. Marcion, Justin Martyr, some of these guys came on the scene who began to bring a very mystical, corrupt, pagan teachings into the church. Marcy, on one of the earlier ones, corrupted the word of God tremendously, rejected all of the New Testament except for Luke, and then rewrote it to fit his own concepts. Justin Martyr, who was a pagan high priest, he came into the Christian church, and he's the one that brought with him the, the pagan robes that pastors wear in pulpits today in many different denominations, but they came right out of paganism through Justin Martyr. These things begin to develop by the time we get to the time of Constantine. Look at what happened. Constantine, remember, Christianity was illegal until Constantine made it legal. Now, anybody remember when that was? Nope. 313. Yeah. 331. Uh, on the other side is when Alexander conquered the world. <laughs> okay. BC 313 AD was Constantine. 323 was his Sunday law. So you see, the corruption came in. With Constantine's professed conversion, Christianity became legal. And guess what? Everybody wanted to be a member of Constantine's church. I want to be a member of the church of the ruler. And corruption began to come into the church. And it continued, as you look at church history, it continued with these various corruptions coming in until there were so many various segments and diversified beliefs within Christianity that it appears that the church had lost sight of the eternal truth that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, as well as one body and one spirit. And so there were followers of different church fathers, followers of people in different parts of the world, whether it was in North Africa or in Constantinople or in Rome or in different places. It began to become many factions and this one body is the one true church according to scripture which has not departed from the teachings and the authority of his word to follow the commandments and traditions of men or the doctrines of devils and those cunningly devised fables. One group of people will stand on the word of God and the word of God alone. Okay. And to these faithful followers, Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And his little flock are yet scattered around the world in many aspects of these factions of Babylon. Many are yet in Babylon, but he calls them to come out and to come into his one fold. Go to John for a moment. We're going to we're going to do one more segment on this the next time. Go to John in the tenth chapter. John chapter ten. Look what Jesus says here. Verse 16, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and what? One shepherd. One church, one shepherd. There are many different Christs in these many different denominations today. And they think that it's all the same guy. We even have people today even saying, oh, well, Allah and Jehovah are the same person. No, 
they are not. Jesus asked through the prophet Amos, can two walk together except what? They agreed. Except they be agreed. So the question is, is my life in harmony with God's word? And for if it's not, it's absurd for one to think that they are walking with God while living in rejection of God's word and his will. It becomes an impossibility. And so realizing the urgency of God's call for his people to come out of Babylon, it is imperative that we turn our attention to that one fold, to that remnant church into which they are to come. And that's where I want us to pick up our study the next time so that we don't have to rush through this. We have 20 specific points that identify the true church. 20 specific points. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. To come out of Babylon is to come into the true or the remnant church. Thank you for waking me up. To come into the true or the remnant church. There's only one. It doesn't say the true or remnant churches. There's only one. It's singular. One Lord, one faith. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So next time we will take a look at the 20 identifying points. Yes. Many of them are still there. I know some of them. Yeah. Yeah, you see, when people come out from under oppression, they're looking for something. And once that they forget what the oppression was like, they go back. Remember what happened to the churches in this country on September the 11th, on 9-11? They filled up quickly. All the churches were filled. Where are they today? They have forgotten. And friends, whenever there is some calamity, some cataclysmic event that takes place, people then want to come to the Lord. But they don't seek him while he's near, while he can be found. So it's, it's, it's really a, a, a problem today, but we must understand that God's people are out there in Babylon. God calls them to come out. He calls them to come to his fold. And there are 17 identifying points of Babylon. And there are 20 identifying points of the remnant. And that's where we'll look next time. We'll kind of do a contrast between the two of them. Tino? I think uh, seven days after this church in Bukhara is starting to be a, the church starting to be a Babylon. Yeah, I do not know. Uh, I, the preacher, the preacher, where it reads, which he preached. Which one? The main pre, the, the senior pastor? The, yeah, the pastor of the church yeah. in Bukhara. Yeah, and it... And, if you look around you, you can go to almost any of our churches, and they all are doing it. The majority, I would say 98, 99 percent. And uh, yes, we, we have, we've forgotten. We don't care. Everybody else is doing it, so we can do it too. So there's some strong counsel we have on that, but we'll pick that up in a different study. Anything else before we have prayer? Yes, Salvador. Yeah, 
they, they are, you see, I don't know if many of you are aware that we have put out another book now called The Three Angels' Messages. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only book of its kind that uh, has been written now that addresses these very issues. And it's, uh, it's been proved it is at the, uh, at the printers. The problem is the it was, we had hoped it would be ready by this week, but uh, the company closed for two weeks, so it'll be after the first of the year before we have that book out. Yay. Yeah. Yes, and with the people, that's true. I look much stronger on the leaders of the church, the pastors. I mean, we have counsel. Now, I want you to, to grasp this. In the Old Testament, were there stronger requirements for the priesthood than for the people? Yes, there was. Today in Christianity, there is much stronger requirements for the pastors than for the people. Do you know, well, most of you do because we spoke on this, but do you know that we have counsel to lay aside flesh food? That's a free choice for any of the people that are Seventh-day Adventists, except for the pastors. And we have counsel that any Seventh-day Adventist minister that does not lay aside the use of flesh foods should be dismissed from the ministry. Uh, that's a good question, and I, I bring these up frequently, and I'm accused of being, you know, fanatical, legalistic, unloving, you know, harsh. I, they can call me what they want. If God has said something, we must stand by what it does say. We don't, we don't have an option. Oh, well, if you, if you feel comfortable presenting this truth from my word, do it. If you don't, just leave it alone. We'll let somebody else worry about it. I have talked to groups ministerial meetings to where all of the pastors in this particular conference the president wanted me to talk to them on how I address standards in evangelism and I did and it shocked every one of them oh that should not be presented from the pulpit no is is it a teaching from God's word well yes well then is there any teaching of God's word that we should be hesitant to preach from the pulpit of God's church well this one yes it should be done in the privacy of their homes. No, it shouldn't. We preach it before the whole world with no shame. Yes. But I'll give you one. This, the same church he's mentioning, there's a teacher in that church, Sabbath school teacher, who rejects the sanctuary, rejects the spirit of prophecy, and follows one of the apostates of this church, but yet he teaches Sabbath school in that church. Let's pray together. I got to pray. Father, we do want to thank you so much for the privilege that we've had to be here and study today. And Lord, as we conclude our study now, we ask that your spirit would continue to guide us in the following service. But we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, Tino, you had a thought. I just had to close.